Let's go to prayer for Mr. Todd. Dear Lord and mighty Lord, thank you for Mr. Todd and Miss Jana. Thank you for letting us all be here today. Please let everybody learn something new from Mr. Todd's sermon. Amen. 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 Thank you, Henry. It's a great weekend, isn't it? I mean, it's been a great weekend. And we have a great weekend coming up next week. And you, all, you, you thought I was going to maybe talk about the OU Texas game, didn't you? Surely you wouldn't think that I would get up here before my sermon and take the ad opportunity to tout that my team beat Jim Starnes' team yesterday, would you? I wouldn't do that, and actually this is not really appropriate for me to do this. So, you know, I won't do that, because it's not really appropriate for me to get up here and talk about how my team whipped someone else's team yesterday, right? Next weekend, we have our homecoming. And so I want everyone to make sure you're here next weekend. We're going to be out of town uh, because Jen and I are going to see the Phillies. We beat the Braves again tomorrow night. Uh, but uh, that's probably inappropriate too, isn't it? Yeah. It's all right. So anyway, church, next weekend's homecoming. Everyone, Friday is planting. It's a day of planting, right, Luke? But check with us. Because there's planting to do next weekend because we need to, we, we have lots of stuff to do to get ready for homecoming. So everyone, make sure you sign up for homecoming if you're visiting with us this week. Uh, just hang around and uh, you can stay an extra few days next Sunday for homecoming. Uh, it's next Saturday night's meal. Please sign up. Do everything you need to do. Uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I, my voice is not going to make it through the sermon yesterday after all the games yesterday. Uh, <laughs> But I do tell you, we, Jan and I, before the games got started, were able to see Chip and Jilda yesterday. And Jilda is, while well, yesterday she wasn't that awesome, she was turning the corner. And, uh, and uh, I think after she got to see Jana, maybe me, it, it did it for her. And, uh, and she's doing very, very well now. So please continue to remember her and her prayers. Uh, God has been so good to this family. It's been so good to John Brockman, it's been so good to everyone in our family who's had Ill, illness and troubles, because God is good, and all the time. Amen, church. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, please take them out and turn to the book of Acts. We're coming to chapter 28 of the story this week. If you're not familiar with the story, it's an abridged version of the Bible done by Max Lucado in, in chronological order. It doesn't cover every story of the Bible, but it, it, it puts, for us, puts together for us a picture of God's upper story, a picture of what was intended from the beginning. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. So as we come to chapter 28 of the story, our prayer this week, our prayer for this church is that we desire to be disciples of Jesus Christ. That we desire to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And that we desire to mature disciples of Jesus Christ. Because, right, that's the reason we're here as a church. And as this morning, as we come to this word in Acts, we're going to dig in to try to understand exactly what it means to be and make and mature disciples of Jesus Christ. When we come to this first half of the book of Acts, we witness a very important transition. We witness a transition from a life where God was among us through the life of Jesus Christ to where it is now, through the Holy Spirit, God being with us through the life of Jesus Christ. And, and if you don't believe me when I say that, if you just listen to the words that Rob had today and what I'm going to say today, you know the Holy Spirit is at work right here. You know, we've seen a progression so far in the story, a, pro a progression where in the beginning of the Word, the Bible tells us that everything that was created, seen and unseen, was created with the Word. Jesus. He was there from the beginning. And then the Word became the half that was written on tablets of stone. Something that could be read. Something that could be encountered, if you will. 
something that could be studied for us to learn the will of God. Well, that word that was there in the beginning and then written on stone, the Apostle John says so appropriately and so effectively when he said that word became flesh and that word tabernacled or lived with us, lived among us. And now, as Jeremiah had predicted, there will be a day when, when God will no longer write that word on pages or on tablets, but that he'll write it on human hearts. You know, Paul would so appropriately say, in that, we become the word. That we, everyone in this room right now, become living letters. That we would be walking around billboards saying, this is the Lord. And I'll tell you, many of you this week, if not all of us, at some point in time in this week, we'll come across somebody where we're the only Bible that they know. And so as we come to the Word of God this morning, the key verse that we're going to focus on in the book of Acts is in chapter 1 and verse 8. And it says this, Jesus speaking, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all of Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Chris led our scripture this morning in Matthew, something we call the Great Commission, the Great Send Out. And here it is again in Acts, again from Jesus' own lips, you will be my witness So as a church, what do we do? As a church, what did that first church do? Did they scurry around and form committees? Did they get work details together? Did they take the brightest minds and and, and work on a budget? I mean, surely there was a flurry of activity. Well, in Acts 1 and 14, it tells us what they did. And it says this, they all joined together. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The first thing we need to understand about the early church, the first thing we need to understand from the Acts this morning, church, the first thing we need to understand on being disciples is that we find a group of disciples in God's Word who depended on prayer. They depended on prayer. Now these disciples, they they came from varied backgrounds. Some were men, some were women. Some were leaders and some were followers. There were those who were rookies in the faith. And those who had been following none other than God himself for three and a half years. Gleaning from his daily instruction. There were those who by way of occupation were tax collectors. Those who were fishermen. There were even those who were occupied, right? Occupied, not by one, as in Mary, but by the fullness of demons. And so we have all these folks with varied backgrounds, but no matter what their background was, no matter where they came from, no matter what they did, we now find them all on their knees in prayer. We find a group who's obedient on waiting and depending on prayer. So the obvious question comes up, how long have they been praying? A session, maybe? Maybe they prayed an entire service. Maybe they they spent an entire evening together and prayed. Well, church, from Passover to Pentecost was 50 days. And the Gospels tell us that, that Jesus was with them for 40 days. And then he gives them an admonition. He gives them this command to pray, to wait on the Lord. And they don't just pray for a service. They don't just pray for an evening, but for 10 days. For 10 days, they beg the Lord to come and empower them. Empower them to the deed that he'd called them to. You know, really quickly this morning as I was studying about the early church this week, 
there was a thought that came to me. If there was ever a group of disciples who didn't need to pray, my first thought would be, it's this group. And you might ask me why I would think of this, but they had the perfect teacher, right? For three and a half years. They had the perfect example. They, they had the perfect teacher delivering the perfect lessons. Their example led perfect behavior, a sinless life. Their example showed them God's power through the miracles. Was his timing slightly off? It was perfect. Everything that Jesus had done for three and a half years was unbelievably perfect in informing his disciples. And if there had ever been a group of followers who didn't need to pray, who were so far beyond any of us sitting in this room today, I would think it would be this group. But yet Jesus looks at these folks, this group of people who had been informed, and he said, you've been informed but you've not yet been transformed. And though you've heard from none other than me, God in the flesh, you now need to get on your knees and you need to pray and you need to wait in prayer. And that's why the most important thing that we can do today as a church, as a group of Christians, with everything that's going on in our world, is to pray. Because you see, church, the goal for us is not to be informed. The goal for us is to be transformed. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 20, the Apostle Paul says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but the kingdom of God is a matter of prayer. And because of that, in God's Word this morning, we find a group of disciples who not only depend upon prayer, But we find a group of disciples disciples who dwell in his power. And that's because the two were tied together. It was because of their prayer that we now find them operating in a power that was unbelievable. I want to go back to Acts 1 and 8. But this time I want to read you the entire verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then you'll be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. Once you receive that power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. You know, we talked about it last week, that power You remember that power that was the same power that God exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Church, that's the power we dwell in when we depend on prayer. You know, this morning, there's many of us in here and in our country and more than ever in our world who want a revival. Amen? Church, that revival will never come until we as a church begin to seek our God in prayer. He said, wait on me, and then you'll receive a transforming. A transforming. Do you get it? Not an informing, a transforming. Because that power is the same power that he himself exerted in raising Jesus Christ from the dead. Church, we see in Acts this wonderful cooperation. And it's a cooperation between the apostles and the disciples and Jesus. And if you find a Bible that's old enough, you'll see in Acts on that first page a subheading right under the title that says Acts of the Apostles. And even though it wasn't there in the original Greek, some smart person said, This is the subheading. Because if you read this book, you're going to see some wonderful, unbelievable, powerful acts that come by means of the apostles. And I'm not here to argue with that this morning. But if you read Acts 1 and 1, you might think about that statement a little. 
Because Acts, in Acts 1 and 1, Luke, he writes this. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and began to teach. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, you might just want to turn to that first page of Acts and you'd be just as, as true, just as correct to scribe in there the Acts of Jesus. Because church, when we see the church operating in that power, they're acting as Jesus is acting through them in powerful, unbelievable, earth-changing ways. And that's the cooperation that we know as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Church, it's a co-mission. Because what did Jesus say? Go to the ends of the earth and, well, I'll catch you later. No. Go to the ends of the earth because I'll be with you always. I'm not going anywhere. This cooperation is a co-mission and it's the power of God through the presence of Jesus but in the practice of disciples. And the word for that is faith. Right, Rob? It's faith. Faith is what brings it all into being. Power and prayer. Prayer and power coming together. You know, you can go to a lot of churches and you find people trying to manage the church. And I'm not casting stones because we've all fallen into that from one time to another, where we're just trying to manage the church. But what the books of Acts teaches us is it's not about managing the church. It's about grasping the kingdom. And it's the king himself that grasps it, grasps it for us and brings that through us. Church, it's prayer and power coming together. Let me give you an illustration. So Jan and I, we bought a, a plug-in hybrid car about a year ago. And after getting that car home, we found that, well, we had a, we had a challenge. Because we'd pull into our parking garage, inside the parking garage, and we'd get out of the car, and the little light from my garage door opener wasn't bright enough for me to figure out how to plug the car in. Because the thing's, it's tight to get on there. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole. I was stuck. So I installed a light with a motion detector on it, or a light switch with a motion detector on it. And now when I pull in, the big bright fluorescent lights pop on. We can, we can park the car, we can get out of the car, we can do what we need to do, and I can easily plug that plug into the car. And the cool thing about this setup is that the power is always there in the garage. But I have to move around to get that power moving. Now the sensor... It's very sensitive. So the slightest movement invokes the power. Well, that's the analogy I want to make. Because church, our God's sensor is just like that. If you give him an ever slight positive movement of faith, the power's ready. But it takes a movement of faith, an act of a disciple, that act of a believer, where the power of God through the presence of Jesus co-mingles in a cooperation and a co-mission and when that happens church it'll change your life it'll change your life and it'll change your marriage it'll change your life and it'll change your relationships it, it, it'll change your life and it'll change the way you act at work because this is faith and church these are the people we encounter today in god's word a friend once gave me a saying about faith. And he said, faith is acting like it is so, even when it's not so, so that it might be so because he says so. You get it? Let me say it again. Faith, that moving around part, faith is acting like it is so, even when it's not so. So that it might be so, simply because our God says so. And with that kind of prayer and that kind of power, I guess we would never encounter problems, right? 
Church, the number three thing we find about this early church in the book of Acts, the thing we find about being a disciple is we find a group of disciples who grow through problems. And they grow through problems because they encountered problems. When we look at this early church, if you want to talk about an eldership, they didn't even have an eldership. They had a group of apostles. A group of apostles who were wondering what's going to go on when their church in a few days goes from 120 to over 3,000. Talk about a blessing and a curse all at the same time. You know, there are people that prefer a smaller congregation, and that's what they had before the day of Pentecost. And on that day, 3,000 members. And get this, they spoke according to Acts 15 different languages. Now, we're told on that day of Pentecost, they all understood what the apostles said, but we're not told they understood what each other said. 15 different languages, different ethnic groups, and all but 120 of them are infant baby Christians. Talk about a group of people who are going to encounter problems. And they don't just encounter problems, but because they're made up of people, they all have imperfections. In Acts chapter 5, you have two people who are well known for being a part of that New, that New Testament, that new first church, Ananias and Sapphira, where Peter looks at them and says, you're full of Satan. And while we tend to think everyone in that New Testament church, in that first church, was full of the Spirit, that's not how it was. Some of them were full of Satan. In Acts chapter 6, you had widows who, because of their heritage, because of their ethnicity, were being skipped when it came to the daily disbursement of food. You know what the word that we use for that today is? And it was in their church? Yeah, racists. They had racists in their church. <laughs> Todd, that only happens out in the world. It happens in the church. And in Acts chapter 8, they were slow to go to Samaria. I mean, they went to Samaria, but they were slow to go. And they only went there because they were persecuted and forced to go there. And when were they asked? They were asked to go there in Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 2, and 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Church, not only were they, were they committing sins of commission, they were committing sins of omission. In Acts chapter 10, one of the leaders of the church, Peter, he used words like, no Lord, no. We have the leader of the church telling God in an argument that he's not going to do that. Because the church was filled with imperfections. They were filled with imperfections. And if you're visiting here with us today, or if you're a member who's been here for 40 years, Bernard, let me tell you something about the people who are sitting next to you. Look around. Because the person on your right and the person on your left are sinners. They're sinners. Your preacher today, sinner. Your elders, sinners. Your deacons, sinners. We're filled with imperfections. We're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to have problems. And not only are we going to have problems, but there's going to be persecution. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Because it's not enough that the stuff within us would bring about problems. But for that first church, verse, verse 1, chapter 8, and Saul approved of their killing him, referring to Stephen. And on that great day, or on that day, horrible day, a great persecution broke out against the church. A great persecution against the church in Jerusalem and every one of them, all 3,000 plus, whatever the church had grown to by this time, every single one of them were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, he began to destroy the church. Saul went from house to house and he dragged off both men and women and he put them in prison. So how do you think that's going to work out? How do you think it's going to work out for all these new Christians to be persecuted and kicked out of their house? 
kicked out of their cities, having to flee to another country. Let me tell you how it worked out in verse 4. Those who had been scattered, what did they do? They preached the word wherever they went. Those who were persecuted preached the word wherever they went because their problems and their imperfections and their persecution turned out to the glory of God. You know, a friend of mine who I used to go to church with in Tulsa, he was telling me a story about their Spanish minister. Their Spanish minister's name is Francisco. Francisco was sitting at a red light at an intersection when all of a sudden, bam, a car rear-ended him from behind. And I don't know what you would do if that happened to you, but I know what I would do if it happened to me, and it probably wouldn't be pretty. So when my friend asked Francisco, well, what did you say when you got out of the car? Francisco answered him, Bible study. What? Bible study. And before that week was up, he had not just had one, but he'd had five Bible studies with the guy who rear-ended him. And I said, no way. I don't believe it. And he sent me this picture. This picture of Marco and his wife, who've now been baptized by Francisco. Amen, church? One of us. One of us is probably going to be rear-ended this week or this month or this year, either in reality or metaphorically. And it'll probably bring around a huge disappointment. And we'll probably feel slighted, we'll probably feel hurt. And it may be in the form of persecution or it may be someone else's sin falling onto you. But those who were scattered, those who were sinned against, Those who'd been persecuted and driven from their homes, wherever they went, they preached the Word of God. Because church, problems are nothing more than a platform to share Jesus. And persecutions, nothing more than a platform to share God. And this leads us to our most important point this morning. The fourth point about this early church. The thing we find here in the book of Acts is we find a group of disciples, period. We find a church, and that means they cared for each other. The first church conflict dealt with people who weren't caring for each other, and so they got together to see how they could care for each other, and then the first church program was instigated to care for each other. The first church fundraiser, right, was Paul gathering funds to care for each other. The first church conference had a big decision to make. And when they made that decision, on the hills of that, they said in Galatians 2 and 10, continue to remember the poor. You can do this or that, but there's one thing that you must do. Care for your members. Care for those who are hurting. And we do that at this congregation better than I've ever seen. Amen, John Brockman? Church, we find in Acts a group of disciples. In Acts 2 and 42, it says they. The pronoun had changed in a good way. They. All the believers were together. A group of people who were committed to loving one another even when it was hard. And they answered Jesus' prayer. They answered his desire. They answered his statement that he made in John 13 and 35 when he said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. Gary Nesbitt, He spent seven years working for Dow Mattress Company up in the Northeast, up in Maine, delivering mattresses. He drove a truck. And in his seventh year, he got a partner, Randy Jobert. Business was doing well. They needed more delivery guys. They had two in their truck now. And so they made the rounds 
together throughout the Northeast delivering mattresses. And it wasn't just on one occasion, but almost every occasion, and you can tell by looking at them, the houses where they delivered the mattresses to, people thought they looked alike. There's Gary and Randy up there. Excuse me. And they do kind of look alike, right? Same hair, same glasses, same goatee, same stocky build. They even do the brims of their hat the same. Well, Randy, the guy in the Nike shirt, as a child, he'd been adopted by a wonderful family. And because of some of the new laws in Maine, he now had unprecedented access to his birth information. So he began to wonder. And he talked to his new friend Gary about this one day there in the truck. And the conversation led to the fact that they both grew up in the same area. You know where this is going, right? They both played for rival football teams in high school. And then one day after looking into those records, Randy asked Gary, and he said, I don't want to get too personal here. I know we've just become friends, but are you adopted? Big statement. To which Gary answered, yeah. And Randy responded to his response, and he said, do you mind telling me what your mother's name was? And about the time Gary was going to answer, Randy said, was it this? And Gary took off his hat, and he said, how'd you know that? You see, they were both adopted. And what are the chances that the two of these guys are brothers? Two guys who never knew each other and are now working on the same mattress delivery truck. There they are. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Well, if that weren't cool enough, the media in their area got a hold of the story. And they played their story on the evening news. You know, 28 minutes of horror followed by two minutes of a feel-good story. That's the news today. So as they're playing this, they're hyping it up in previews. And there's a lady who saw this story on the news. And that lady knew she had two brothers. And she realized while this story was playing that she was their sister. And she gets them through the news. And they're all united. Church, I tell you this story because when the church begins to love each other like family, those outside the community, they hear about it. And they want to know about it. And they know we're disciples by our love for one another. But church, we're all sinners, right? I made that clear earlier. And and there's going to be tough There's going to be times that it's really tough because you're going to get treated poorly sometimes. But in that, you get to bear the same cross that Jesus bore and grow as a disciple and mature as a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, in that early church, it was the waters of baptism and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And while water and fire don't usually mix well together, In the book of Acts, it was the waters of baptism and the fire of the Holy Spirit that that fueled the growth of that church. And frankly, it's the reason why we're all sitting here today, some 2,000 years later. We're here because of the waters of baptism and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, you you, you may want to get your pens out for this one. Turn to Acts 2 and 40. And it says this in Acts 2, 4, it says, if you want this fire in your life, if you want this power that comes through prayer in your life, if you want the ability to, when someone rear-ends you, instead of going off on them, to invite them into a Bible study. If that's what you want for your life, if that's what you want for your marriage, if that's what you want for your relationship with your, your, your family and your brothers and sisters in Christ, Let me back up and start at verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? I love love what we read in verse 38, where Peter says, let me think about it. Where he says, let me get back to you. 
you know, we're going to get a group together, we're going to fill this out, and we'll let you know. (laughs) It's not what Peter says. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And what happens next? May you will receive the gift of the holy spirit not you may not you might you will receive the gift of the holy spirit because that promise is for you and your children and all those who are far off for all those who the lord god will call verse 40 with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. That save yourselves from this corrupt generation in the original language is a passive imperative. It's something that you don't do. It's passive. It's something that's done to you. But yet, it's imperative. So so you might just rephrase this right here. You might say, let yourselves be saved. Because it's God doing it. But it's an imperative and that you have to let yourself be saved. Let me give you an analogy. There's a thousand steps between you and God. And God's taken 990 of those, 999 of those already. But he won't take that last step against your free will. You see, church, you have to decide to surrender your rebellion. You have to decide to be baptized and then allow that holy spirit and that power we've been talking about for the last two weeks to reside in you and church among anything that i've said tonight today this morning that's bible that's living words from a loving god who wants you to take that step who wants you to greet him who wants you to walk into his loving arms and let him wrap those arms around you And when we do that, church, we begin to see each other in a different light. When we work in the kingdom together, what we start seeing is a resemblance where you look like my brother, or you look like my sister, where we start looking like him. And church, when the world sees that, they want some of that. Church, it's time for us in here and out there to stop being informed. It's time for us to be transformed. And if you find yourself today and you're sitting in that pew and you don't feel that power, you don't feel the power that Jesus, that was used on Jesus when it raised, when God raised him from the dead. If you sit there today and you don't feel the power of the Holy Spirit in you, then it's time to take that step. Do it in baptism. If you've already been baptized and you still don't feel that power, it's time to stop being informed. And it's time to be transformed. Individually and as a family. That's what we've got to do starting today. Let our light shine for him. Church, if you don't feel that power, if you don't feel the Holy Spirit working in your life, that's what we're here for as family. To resemble each other, to look like each other, and to lift each other up. So if you need to respond to God's call this morning, please do so. So we as a family can be together. Please come while we stand and sing.